Hi everyone, welcome to the Data Idol Summer School and welcome to all of our community. I'm Adam, I'm a technical recruiter here at Data Idols um, and just to give you an overview, the Summer School is a new pilot programme in partnership with the Data Science Festival. Um, it will run live for three months uh, so you can learn in real time and pick up new skills from the comfort of your own home. Uh, the sessions are all designed at an introductory level so it's ideal for people making that transition into a data career, students uh, or anyone uh, starting out their, their career in data. You can get involved with the community on our Slack channel. It's Data Idols SS, which we'll put a link for in the chat. Uh, so you can ask any uh, event related questions, comments or, or feedback. Um, I'd also like to thank all of our partners uh, who have made this event a, a real success and, and not forgetting the 400 hours that the team here have put into uh, making the summer school a reality. So all sessions are pre-recorded and can be watched back at a later date starting in September. You'll get emailed a link at the beginning of September and they'll be free to watch. So anything you miss uh, or anything you want to learn at your own pace, it will be available at that time. So today's session is uh, machine learning enabled by network graphs, uh, and that is by Claire from Neo4j. Enjoy the session. My name is Claire Sullivan, and I am a data science advocate at Neo4j, and I am speaking to you today from the mountains of Colorado in the United States, and just wanted to thank everybody for coming to my talk today. Today we're going to talk about machine learning enabled by network graphs and, and the power of connecting your data. And this is really a very fun topic. I, I really love talking about this because this is data science at the next level. And I'll talk about why in a minute, but you know, the preview, the special sneak preview is that there's a lot of power when we talk about not just individual data points, but the relationships between those data points. I'm gonna give you a ton of examples today. I'm gonna to walk you through some code and show you how that you can do this on your own. So let's just dive right in. Um, when we talk about networks, we talk about graphs, social graphs, knowledge graphs, there's all kinds of graphs out there, but really just a graph is what happens when you connect data. Um, and sometimes, frequently in fact, you can get better solutions when you augment your existing data with a graph or you turn your data into a graph. But then that naturally leads to the question, well, what is a graphy problem? How do I know I have a problem that would lend itself well to graphs? Well, we're gonna show some examples of that and it, really when I started putting these slides together and started realizing just how many problems out there are so-called graphy problems, I was even surprised. Um, so then we're going to talk about how to create a graph. And in fact, I'm going to show you how you can create your own. Um, and then what do you do with it once you have it? And then the people in this, this conversation today, most are, most are going to care about, okay, I've got a graph. I've got some questions I want to answer with it, but now I've got some models I want to create with it. And I want to make some predictions of things. And I'll show you how to do that too towards the end. The code that I'm going to show today is all available on a GitHub repository, and I'll share that link with you at the very end. Okay, so what is a graph? Simply put, it's just stuff connected to other stuff. So here you see I've got circles, and they represent th these things we call nodes. And those nodes might be people in a social network, or they could be routers to look at internet traffic. Maybe they're maps, um, and ma the, the little circles, the nodes are the stops along the way. Um, we could use these graphs for things like recommender systems. Search, most of search is based off of graphs. Um, and then knowledge graphs, um, question answering. This is actually the basis for what's inside Google today. So what's inside Google today, a lot of what you internet, interact with on the internet is a graph. So that's cool. Um, let's talk about some graph terminology here, just so we're all on the same page. We have several different ways that we can talk about graphs. We have directed graphs, undirected graphs, weighted graphs. Um, what I'm showing here on the left is what we would call an undirected graph. I have nodes, which are those circles, and they're connected to the other nodes with these lines. And we call those lines relationships or edges. Sometimes nodes are called vertices. They're all the same thing. Okay, but 
in this particular graph, this undirected graph, what I see here is that there's just some sort of relationship. This might be like Facebook, okay? Like that center blue dot is friended with a lot of other dots, a lot of other nodes, and they're friended back with them. So in Facebook, there is no directionality of that relationship. Somebody, if two nodes are connected, they're both friends with each other, but that's not true for say Twitter. So this graph that I show on the right here is what we would call a directed graph. So Twitter being the example here, I can follow somebody on Twitter, but they don't necessarily follow me. Okay, so that's why we have the arrow here. That blue, the blue dot in the center is being followed by a lot of, a lot of these nodes here. So like take for instance, the white node that's roughly in the 12 o'clock position. We see the arrow coming down towards the blue dot re representing that the white node is following the blue node, but the blue node is not following the white node. Now, if you look at, say, the connection between the blue node in the center and the green node roughly at the 10 o'clock position, what we see is that both of them are following each other. So that's a directed graph. We can add one next layer to this when we talk about a weighted graph. So I just added some numbers here to the graph on the left. And what this indicates is the strength of connection between two nodes. So for instance, the central blue node and the blue node at roughly the one o'clock position have a weight of 10, whereas those two red nodes on the right only have a weight of one. So, you know, perhaps this is how often do those two nodes communicate with each other, or maybe it represents um, distance between two nodes on, on, a, on a map or something like that. But just, just to keep in the back of our heads that that's, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about these uh, different types of graphs. Now graphs can be represented as numbers, which makes us as data scientists very happy. And we would represent those as numbers in this thing that we call the adjacency matrix. Now the adjacency matrix is just ones and zeros, just like we're used to. Um, and it indicates whether I have a connection between each of my nodes. So for instance, if you look at column A, you can see column A at row B has, has a value of one, which indicates that A and B are connected. Um, more specifically, we see that B in the row is connected to A by the representation of one. Now, if this was an undirected graph, we would see that this matrix is actually symmetric about uh, the diagonal. But just in this case, I'm showing a directed graph just so you can kind of see all the power within the adjacency matrix. Okay, so why, why would I want to use a graph? Why might it help? I'm going, to, I'm going to talk you through two different problems here that are common within data science. First, this is a churn prediction problem in social media. I have created a social network here, um, fictitious of course, around Barack Obama. Um, and you see here that Barack Obama is connected to several different people. It might be hard to see all of the, uh, the images, but at roughly the eight o'clock position, we see that Barack Obama is connected to Michelle Obama, and Michelle Obama is connected to Sasha and Malia. Um, makes sense. And then we see at you know we see that Barack Obama is connected to Joe Biden. Um, <clears throat> there's a connection through Elaine Chao to Mitch McConnell. Here's Nancy Pelosi. Okay, so as data scientists, we might be asked, how would I predict churn? Now, we could take all of these different people here and we could represent them as some sort of vector embedding. And, you know, I'm going to have columns of numbers and, you know, each person here is a row. And I can predict the probability based on some model that each of these characters here will churn. That's all well and good, but what it does is it ignores the fact that these people are connected to each other. So our probability of churn in a social network greatly increases if one of our friends churns. So let's say, for instance, Michelle Obama decides, I'm no longer interested in this social network, I'm getting off. Okay. Now we can assume, and it's a good assumption, that the probability that Barack Obama churning goes up because we did not treat those two data points as independent data points. They are related to each other. And by looking at the power of that connection, our churn prediction becomes much more accurate. Let me show you another example. Okay, this, this is kind of silly here. I'm looking at a mailbox. And um, this is actually a real world example from my life. I was building a house here in Colorado recently. And so I would go to the local big box hardware store to buy parts. And 
you know, they look at what am I buying and they say, okay, Claire is buying wood and nails. Oh, Claire, Claire's buying a lot of wood and nails. She must be building a house. Great. Okay. So we're going to recommend other things that Claire might need to build a house. So we, wood and nails means she's early in the process. So let's recommend hammers and let's recommend, um, you know, maybe some subflooring, stuff like this. Great. Okay. So as we go down the path here, Claire's getting close to the completion of her house because now we can see she's buying landscaping things. Let's recommend to Claire a mailbox. So my local big box hardware store has, has this huge row of mailboxes. Now, why did I not buy a mailbox? Well, they don't know because I, I should have bought a mailbox. However, that's treating me as an individual data point. If you look at my geographic neighborhood, as in the people who live around me, none of us bought mailboxes. Why? Well, it's because we don't have mail service in my county. My apologies about my little reminder window here. Um, we don't have mail service in my county. So none of us buy mailboxes. We have to use post office boxes. And yet this big box chain store has a whole row of mailboxes collecting dust because they applied traditional machine learning to say, hey, we need to stock this store with all these mailboxes. So um, just, just a thought that had they looked at the fact that none of my neighbors right here bought mailboxes, they would have known. Okay, so the power of, of relationships. Okay. So moving along, how do you know you have a graphy problem? Okay, there is one thing that I like to tell people, you know, data scientists, we're all used to working with like SQL tables, relational databases, databases where you have a, a predefined schema, you have rows, you have columns, you can do a search, you know, a select, some sort of matching type thing within these databases. Um, and as we get more sophisticated within our data science journey, we start doing joins on these tables. Well, I have to get this little bit of data over here and join it with this little bit here and calculate something and get something out and join it over here. Here's one telltale hint that you have a graphy problem when you're, when you're dealing with problems like this. If you are using multiple joins, you probably have a problem that is better represented as a graph. Okay. Um, so again, this is, this is just looking at, you know, what one of those relational databases might look like. If you have to use multiple joins to create your final table that is used for this model, really start thinking about this is a graph problem. Um, and the benefit of doing so from in the beginning of this stage, one of the big benefits is speed. I mean, I've talked about the power of relationships, but we all know that joins are slow. Joins are very inefficient. And yet to do this problem in graph space is, is basically you're taking this huge, you know, SQL mess on the page and you're turning it into just a couple of lines of a graph search. Graphs are much better suited to searching through data like this. Okay, so will it graph? For those of you familiar with will it blend? Will it graph? Um, a lot of us are familiar with the very uh, classic MNIST problem identifying uh, handwritten numbers. Will that graph? Well, the answer is yes. Somebody has actually turned this into a graph. And you can see here how they took that image and found all these like high points within the image and turned it into a series of nodes and vertices or, or uh, vertices and relationships. So cool. Uh, facial recognition. Will it graph? Of course it will graph. Um, so we can look at the face as a series of nodes at all kinds of different resolutions. Um, so, you know, I, I have links to these slides within the repo that you will get, and you can see at the bottom that I've got links to the articles for where I pulled all these from. So you can see how people are doing really cool, fun stuff with graphs. Drug discovery, absolutely graphs. Okay. In fact, molecules are graphs. Just look at that thing on the left there. Don't ask me what molecule that is. Chemistry is not my forte, but you know, I, my atoms here. My atoms are nodes. They are bonded with other atoms. That bond is relationship. Some of those bonds are stronger than others, as we, you know, as high school chemistry, I remember at least. Um, you look at the right here. That is actually a knowledge graph around coronavirus. And this is looking at um, different, they, they've got a whole corpus of peer reviewed research articles and scraped them for all the key terms and looked at which terms co occurred with which other terms um, with some regularity. So, so, yeah, those things totally graph. Uh, natural language processing. This is one of my favorites. For those of you who've dealt with NLP, you know, one of the things that we do is we start looking at which, which nouns and verbs and different parts of speech are related to other parts of speech. And we can make little plots like this. And it's words connected by arrows. 
So that's a directed graph. That's, that's a directed graph where my node is one word and the arrow is my relationship uh, between those other words. And this is kind of small. I don't expect that you, you can actually read it, but there's, there's arrows that are called compound or um, end subject or something like this. Um, so, so yeah, NLP itself at its very root is a graph problem. Here's a fun one, body composition analysis. Now, probably you figured out the trend here. Will it graph? Yeah, okay, they're all gonna be a yes. Okay, so here's some actual work that was done looking at body types and how different body shapes cluster. So, um, and, and how different parts of the body shapes cluster. So fun stuff. Okay, how do you create a graph? Well, you're gonna need a few things. First off, let's, uh, Let's look at some of just like the typical files you're going to need. You're going to need um, things like a node list. And I'll show you examples of this in a second. Um, but basically what node lists do is they say, here's every node that's in my graph. And those nodes might have properties like, you know, this node um, is a person and that person is named Claire. So we have a node label person and, an, and a node property, Claire, or, or name of Claire. Then we have an edge list. Okay, so um, maybe my edge list says who I work for. Claire works for, and then another node, which would also be in my node list, Neo4j. So Claire works for node label company, and company has name Neo4j. Now, what I just did is I created a graph model, which that model basically, think about if you're standing at a whiteboard and you're talking about your data. And in fact, if you're gonna do this, a whiteboard is a great way to do this. And you're gonna say, okay, I've got people. So I'm gonna create a people circle and they're connected to companies through this thing called works for. Um, it's, it's just how you sit down and start um, coming up with what is your graph gonna look like? Think of it kind of like how you define your schema for a relational database. Um, and then um, what I'm gonna show you today um, is uh, we're gonna be using a, a graph database. There's, there's several different ways that you can um, start working with your graphs. You can do them in memory on your computer. There's several Python packages out there that will do this. NetworkX is a very common one. But what you're gonna find is there's gonna come a point as you go through your graph journey where these Python packages do not scale. Um, you, you can get up to some, you know, some small graphs, but but if you want to scale your graphs, you're going to need to start considering a graph database, just like you would with any other data science project. Eventually, you want to move to a database. So I'm going to be using a graph database um, today, Neo4j. It's free. Um, but you know, just keep in the back of your head the, that a lot of what I'm going to show today can be done in memory with other Python tools. Um, and again, you know, your choice for these tools, this really depends on your problem. It depends on your infrastructure and scalability needs. So, um, so yeah. Uh, just really quick, we're going to be looking at a, a sample graph today um, using Game of Thrones. For those of you who are Game of Thrones fans, I will warn you, there are spoilers ahead. Um, it's looking at the books, so I'm not giving anything away that happens in the TV show. For those of you who aren't Game of Thrones fans, this won't spoil anything, and I'm going to try to point out things that if you're unfamiliar with the characters or whatnot, it still will make sense. Okay, so on the upper left here, I have a node list. Um, and in this node list, I've got, um, you know, I've got a name, I've got a title, male or female culture. Don't worry about those numbers off the, at the beginning of that uh, table there. Um, so then, you know, all of this is doing is saying that I've got these names and some features, properties associated with them. And I don't even have to fill in all the properties. Some of these people don't have titles or cultures, and that's totally fine. Um, in the table in the bottom right, I have my edge list. So um, I have a name. These are battles, as it turns out. So I have um, the Battle of the Golden Tooth. Don't even ask me what that one is. I don't even know. We've got the Attacker King. We've got the Defender King. Um, so, you know, we might say that Joffrey Baratheon was the Attacker King um, at the Battle of Golden Tooth. Battle of the Golden Tooth. So, so it's just kind of setting up what those relationships are between our nodes within the graph. And there can be multiple types of relationships too. I'm just showing you um, the battles, but there's, as you're gonna see here in a minute, we actually have several types of relationships within the graph that we're gonna use. Okay, I mentioned before graph modeling and why it's important. This is actually, it's very hard to see. I don't expect you to be able to see it, but this is the graph model for the Game of Thrones graph that we're going to be looking at. 
And the, the node that's in the very center, kind of like the teal cyan color is person. Um, at the top, the golden one is called night. Um, there's king, which is the orange one at roughly the two o'clock position. And you can be like, oh, wait a second, but knights are people and kings are people. And the answer is yes, because one entity can have multiple node labels. Those, those things like person and knight and king, those are the labels. And so you can have multiple labels associated with each data point, which is actually really helpful as you'll come to discover. Um, red is house, what house do they belong to? Um, you'll notice the one that's roughly at the 630 position, kind of a bright pink is called dead. Okay, so we're actually gonna play around with um, um, the, these different bits of this graph. If you go read some of my posts, I try to do predictions on the graph of, can I predict if a character is dead or not? Um, so uh, let, let's just move on and have some fun with it. This is zooming in, looking at the actual graph that we're gonna be dealing with here. And this is an eye chart. Again, I don't expect that you can read all of the things in here. You're gonna get to play with this yourself. So, so you know, you're gonna get to, to see what all these things look like. Um, so I have some people here, um, you know, those, those cyan nodes, if you can make it out roughly at the center, I see Arya Stark and Brienne of Tarth. I see Rob Stark as a gold one, just roughly at the center, just off to the right, just slightly. I see House Stark in red. Okay, this is just, this is a zoom in. We'll actually be able to see the whole graph here in a minute when we start playing with it. Okay, let's talk about a few things that we can calculate from our graphs before we get into it. Um, Degree centrality. So um, degree centrality is, um, th these are all different measure, uh, measures of importance. Um, it's how, degree is how many arrows are coming in and out of my node. We could say out degree, which is how many arrows are going out, in degree, how many are coming in, um, but really it's just a function of how connected is that particular node. Um, betweenness centrality, um, you know, this is like, uh, who is the one person who could put me in contact with a whole bunch of other people? So think about your office, think about your workplace. You've got the big boss, right? And especially if you're in a bigger environment, a bigger company, you're not gonna get to just talk to the big boss, right? There's somebody you gotta go through to talk to that person, probably their admin. So that's the person that has the highest betweenness centrality. Who's the person who can hook me up with people? Um, and then pay drink and friends. Pay drink, this is um, the very famous algorithm made famous by Larry Page. It was the very foundation of what is Google today. Google is now much more evolved past this, but pay drink looks at how, it, <clears throat> it was characterizing the entire internet. And it was saying, how important are different web pages? Well, web pages can be important in a few different ways. For instance, um, the size here of our, our nodes is going to indicate the page rank. So larger means higher page rank. <clears throat> so I've got all these little green nodes on the bottom right. And they're not very important. They point at things, but you know they're linked to other web pages. But you know that's that's kind of all they do. My blue node is a little larger because a lot of nodes are linking into it. Now, my yellow node is super important because everybody's linking into that yellow node, okay? But that red node on the, the top has a high page rank. Why? Well, it's because a very important node, the yellow node, linked to it. <clears throat> so page rank just doesn't me measure how many things link to you, but how many of them are important. So for instance, if Barack Obama followed me on Twitter, my page rank just skyrocketed. I need that one person to follow me for that to happen. Okay, pathfinding. Let's look at a pathfinding example. This is my neighborhood here. And what we see, I live in Breckenridge, Colorado, where the little uh, red pin is off to the left. And I want to get to the Denver International Airport on the upper right, okay? This is a graph problem. Okay, what Google does is it creates nodes along the way where all my different turns and whatnot might be. And those are represented as the white dots. You can see that there's a white dot kind of up here by Frisco. I've got other white dots along the path. And what it does, what Google does is it says, okay, what is the weight between each of those? Weight, not W-A-I-T, but W-E-I-G-H-T. Um, what's the weight between each of those nodes? And it considers things like traffic and distance, you know, speed. How long is it going to take me to go from each of these, these nodes to get to my final destination? And you can see that I have roughly two hours and 13 minutes to get there. 
But on the, uh, you see this red box here. That's actually usually the fastest way to get to Denver is following that road, but it's closed. So what Google knew was to remove that relationship from the graph and to send me up towards the north along this other path. Now, if you were to do this on the weekend, you see I have Alma Fairplay down here in a box. It's actually usually faster on the weekends to go this other way. Why? Because I live in a tourist town and all of Denver is coming up here in the mornings on the weekends and they go back down um, in the evenings. So. You know, Google understands how to navigate these weighted paths through pathfinding algorithms. Um, node similarity. Here's another thing we can do with the graph. How similar, and we're, get, we're going to do this exact problem when we get into the demonstration here in a minute. How similar are two nodes within my graph? Well, um, there's all kinds of different ways we can do that, and we think back to our traditional data science approaches. Everything to us is a vector, an embedding, and we can calculate vector similarity through something like cosine similarity, Euclidean distance. And we can do those same things with graphs too. It's going to require us to vectorize our graphs though, and I'll show that in a minute. Last thing here, community detection. Okay, here's a graph. I want to be able to find my, my sub-communities within that graph and sub-communities of the sub-communities. Bunch of different ways to do that. Um, and, and you can go and get experience with all of these things in a variety of platforms, including Neo4j. I'll show you how to find them. Um, and then graph embeddings. That's the thing I was referring to earlier where we turn our graph into vectors. There's a bunch of different ways we can do this, transducive versus inductive, which is basically either I have to, yeah, I get a new data point in and I have to train my entire graph and regenerate my vectors, or I can get a new data point in and train it on the fly. Um, and this, there's a ton of different ways to do this. I'm going to show you one, but I mean, there's, there's, hundreds of different ways that you can vectorize a graph. Really hot area of research that's now starting to enter commercial mainstream capabilities. Um, and these, of course, um, they can be used with neural networks. Some of them are based on neural networks. So you, have, you know, the question always comes up, can I do deep learning with graphs? Absolutely. Um, all we have to do is create a vector or a tensor, depending on what package you're using. Okay. Enough talk. Let's actually do the work. Let's create a database. Now, I'm going to draw your attention to this web link here, dev.neo4j.com slash sandbox. Okay, and what this is going to do is this is going to hook you up with a free database. Let's see. Okay, let's come over here and get us a dev.neo4j.com slash sandbox. Okay. Okay, this is going to take you to this page here, and you're going to come down to the bottom left and click this button, launch the free sandbox. Okay. So it's going to take itself a second, and while it does, I could grab a swig of coffee. Okay, cool. So select a project. Now what you're going to want to do, you can create your own. Let's scroll down a touch here, and we're going to come down to this one called Graph Data Science, because we are graph data scientists. So we're going to launch project right here. Okay, it's going to take itself a second here while it spins up. Okay, cool. We now have a graph database running. Just going to draw your attention here really quick. If you were to click on this down arrow and click connection details, I'm, I'm showing this to you because as data scientists, we tend to be friends of Python. And you absolutely can interface with these databases from Python, just like any normal database. What you're going to want to take note of is three things. Your username will always be Neo4j. Your password will always be contained here. You're going to want to copy this. Um, and you'll be pasting that into your Python code. And you're going to want this bolt URL thing here. This is how you'll make your connection. I'm not going to go, uh, I'm not going to do that right this minute. I'm going to show you the browser, but I will show you how to do that here. Um, shortly. But instead, let's, we're just going to click open to open with browser. Okay. Okay, so it's going to fire up in your browser. Our little user interface. Just give it a sec. And this is what this is, is this is going to be a pre populated database with, um, with the Game of Thrones database. So I want to show you right here. We have a few things here. So I have 2,642 nodes in total. And they're, these are the different node labels. You know, I've got battles and books and kings and 
and all kinds of people. Um, we have relationship types. I have 16,747 relationships and they fall into a whole bunch of different categories. Now I'll tell you this graph was uh, scraped from the books. Um, and if you are into Game of Thrones or who, or who have, have friends who are, you know, there's only five of them. That's a sore subject with a lot of Game of Thrones fans that there are not more. Um, what interacts means is just that the two characters kind of co-occurred within some region of text with each other. Um, and then underscore one means it happens in the first book, underscore two means it happens in the second, et cetera. Um, so then the other thing, when you open this, this guide comes up here. We call these things uh, browser guides, and it will actually walk you through how to do a lot of data science here. I strongly urge you, if you're interested, that you go through this. There's this little arrow button here, and it just kind of plays you through um, how all of this is going to work. It, it'll show you how you would load the data in yourself if it wasn't already here. Um, you can look at the, the schema, um, and all I have to do is just click this little play button for it to run. Okay, so uh, let's see here. I click up here, this little blue arrow, and there's my schema. Okay, so I can kind of move it around and see it. I can pull apart things. Um, there's a surprising amount of math that goes into how, how these little things, all these nodes bob around here, but let's Let's show, um, I am going to uh, show you just a quick little bit of Cypher here. Match. Match is kind of how Cypher says select from SQL. Um, so I'm going to match, meaning select. Now when I have parentheses like this, we're going to use ASCII art um, to, to say what we're trying to match. And so round parentheses mean I'm trying to match a node. So I'm going to just call my node N, okay? And I'm going to say that N has some sort of relationship. My relationships are square brackets, okay? So I've got some sort of relationship and that's gonna be matched. Oh, look, I used my, um, my greater than sign to make an arrow. So that indicates I have a directed relationship to some other node. I'm gonna call it M, okay? So I've got N is somehow connected to M and I'm going to return N N and M. I'm going to limit this to 100 because if it try, you, you get some pretty big visualizations here. It can really bog down things. Okay, so now I have a graph. Let's make it bigger. Okay, I'm going to zoom out a touch. Okay, so I've um, in this graph it tried to create 100 nodes. Came, it doesn't always come completely there. Um, I've got uh, 139 relationships here. And that's all cool. So this is a way that I can look at my graph. I'm going to um, now do, let's get a little more specific. I'm going to match now. I'm going to get a little more specific. I'm going to say a, a variable P, and I'm going to define that my variable P is a person. And I'm going to say that my person, now I'm going to define the relationship type. I'm going to say interacts. My person is going to interact with the people, if you look at the schema, interact with other people. So I'm going to say P2 for my person. Okay, so I've got P and P2. I'm going to return P and P2 and then 100. Let's see what we get. Okay. So now I've got 100 people interactions here. Okay, so that's cool. That's how we're going to interact with our our graph. Okay, so I, I highly recommend you go through that browser guide. You can learn how to do everything that I'm going to show today and then some. You can learn community detection. You can learn node similarity. There's all kinds of great stuff in here. Um, but what I'm going to show you now is we're going to switch over to now Jupyter Notebooks. And like I said, I'm going to provide the, the repo that has all this code in it, including the notebook. Um, and it's, it's a link that I'll, I'll show you at the end here. But I'm going to walk through the Jupyter Notebook that's in there. Um, and so let's just explore a little bit here. There's instructions here on how to um, run that particular uh, uh, browser guide, the Game of Thrones browser guide. Um, the link is here. There are several different ways that you can run Neo4j. I'm sh I just showed you how to do it in Sandbox. Again, that's free. You can download Community Edition uh, for desktop. 
also free. Um, the link that is here is a blog post that I did, which is how you can run in a Docker container and you can have your own Neo4j database on your local machine with Jupyter networked together. You know, there's just a ton of different ways that you can do it. Um, there is a Python driver, an officially supported Python driver. There's unofficial Python drivers like community drivers out there. What's in the notebook is how to make the connection to the database using the official driver. So you'll see code in there. Um, the bottom line is you're going to be um, needing that URI. Um, I showed it to you before over here. Oops, let me come back here. Okay, so, so it's this URL here, the Bolt URL. Um, and then here's your password. You'll be connecting in using something like that. I'm showing you a simple password here. You'll obviously put the sandbox password in or whatever password you use. Um, oh, and by the way, that, uh, that Neo4j colon 7687, that's what it would be if you were using my Docker container. But, you know, whatever, whatever you know, floats your boat here. When you want to run queries, um, this is just the Cypher query. Um, I, I establish my connection, just very similar to how we would do it with Python and SQL. You know, some sort of cursor type environment here. Here I'm just running a, a basic query to count my number of nodes. So any cipher that you want to do, you just create a string with it and you throw it into this uh, query method and it gives you your answer back. So that's all what's in the notebook. Um, but let's actually do some data science. You know, we've been kind of tiptoeing around the subject saying, look, we've got a database, but let's do some cool stuff with it now. Okay. So let's, um, we're going to be using this library called the Graph Data Science Library, or GDS. This is just built into Neo4j. And like I said, you know, this is, this is us using Neo4j. A lot of this stuff also exists within, you know, other uh, graph packages that you might like to use, like, you know, NetworkX or whatever. But the foundation within GDS for Neo4j are these things called in-memory graphs. And what an in-memory graph does, this is, it, it actually is pretty revolutionary in um, graph data science in general. What it does is it says, okay, I have this database and my database might be huge. And when I say huge, I am talking about, you know, tens of billions of nodes and hundreds of billions of relationships. I don't need to compute data science. I don't need to solve data science problems on all of that. If you are doing that, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, you want to select down the data that you want, and then you're going to do your data science on, on that sub-graph. And so that's what these in-memory graphs do, is they create a nice, efficient representation of the stuff that we're going to calculate stuff on. So this command here creates my in-memory graph. My in-memory graph in this case is called people, okay? And what it does is it takes every node that is a label of person, and then this asterisk here says, I want every relationship between person nodes. Okay, so we're gonna run that query. Okay, and now that we've run that query, we've established that in-memory graph, we're going to do some calculations. Like, let's look at page rank. You know, um, if I am looking at every relationship with people in, it, in the graph, I should be able to calculate page rank on that, no problem, cool. Um, here's how we do it. Um, we're going to call the page rank function within GDS, and we're going to stream it. And what stream means is we're going to write it to the screen, okay? And we call it on the graph that's named people. Okay. Now what we're returning back is we're returning back the people by their names and their page ranks, and we're ordering it by page rank. Okay, Tyrion Lannister is the character who comes up with the highest page rank. Makes sense if you know the books. Tyrion, um, for those of you who don't know the books, is one of the foundational characters. Um, he's uh, in all five of the books, so makes sense. Um, if you go down the list, the first handful of names make sense if you know Game of Thrones. But then I start getting to some characters like Yandri and Ysilla. I have... I am a Game of Thrones fan. I have no idea who those characters are. So why am I getting that? Why, why is it that I'm um, coming up with these characters with very high page rank? Well, it's because I was not selective enough in the assembly of my graph, my in-memory graph. I said, I want every single relationship um, within that graph. And in reality, I don't. The, the more specific you can get um, with your queries, the faster the queries are, first off, but also the better the results. You know, it's, it's that whole giggle phenomenon, garbage in, garbage out. If I throw garbage into my in-memory graph, I will get garbage out. There's, just because I'm working with graphs doesn't change that fact. So 
what I need to do is refine my, uh, my in-memory graph a bit to represent what I'm truly looking for. Okay, so instead of using my asterisk as my relationship types, I'm only gonna care about the interactions. So which people are interacting with, with which other people? Okay, so I'm naming my graph people interactions. The nodes are gonna be of node labeled person. And then I'm going to look at all interacts relationships. Now I could do this for each of the books if we wanted, but let's just, let's just go with this. Okay, so now when I stream my results back to the screen, now I have results that make a little bit more sense here. Okay, I'm looking at this screen and most of these names I recognize. Okay, as you start getting towards the bottom, they're a little less recognizable, but those page ranks are higher because they are interacting with people like Tyrion Lannister, who has the highest page rank of all of the characters that we're looking at here. So, okay, that makes sense. I, I can get behind that. Okay, now let's say that I don't wanna just write that to the screen. I want that to be part of my graph. I want it to live forever with the nodes. I want Tyrion Lannister always to have that page rank that we just calculated. We're gonna use um, the function here called write. So I can write my page rank from the people interactions graph back to the individual nodes. Now I have some hyperparameters here um, and you can go read the documentation on these hyperparameters, what they mean. Um, but let's just, the, the one that I'm gonna just call out here is write property. So if I were to run this command here and go back into my sandbox browser, my, uh, the UI, I will now see a property associated with each node called page rank. And in fact, I'm not, I haven't run this on this particular instance because I just spun up the graph, but let's, let's come back here and actually I'm gonna show you what happens. Let's say I go match P for person and I'm gonna return everything about that person. I'm gonna do it just for one character, okay? And I'm gonna go into table here. I have Gunther, son of Gurn. I don't ask me who that is, I don't actually know. Um, and I have identities, so there's um, unique identifiers that are built within the graph. I have page rank calculated a couple different ways. That This was pre-calculated in the graph already. I've got a community that Gunther is attributed to. So this is these are just all of the um, properties associated with that given node. So when I'm back here, I, you know, I have this right property of page rank. That just means that I've written to the database this property. Okay. So um, I started talking about different fun things that we could do like node similarity. Let's do some node similarity. Okay, so um, we have this function called node similarity and it's basically, um, it, it is like a cosine similarity or jacquard similarity. Um, and uh, basically what I'm doing is I'm looking at that people interactions graph. Um, I'm looking at things with a they have to have a certain degree in order for me to consider the similarity. Like um, Guthar, son of Garn, is not gonna have a high degree because like, who knows who they are? They don't do anything. I care about the important characters. Those important characters have a high degree associated with them. So um, what characters are the most similar? What important characters are the most similar? And here's what I get back, okay? So I see Cersei Lannister, who for a while at least is queen, Okay, and she is most similar to Joffrey Baratheon. Well, that makes sense, that's her son. Okay, and he becomes king. So Cersei and Joffrey relate with each other a lot. Then I see Joffrey, this next line is similar to Gregor Clegane. Gregor Clegane, for those of you unfamiliar with him, also uh, called the dog, um, he is Joffrey's kind of assigned bodyguard. Um, and I, you can see that these relationships go both ways. So I've got that, the second line is actually repeated down here. Um, so, so this is just a, a quick way that I could find out which nodes are most similar to which other nodes. And I could, you know, I could say, well, I only care about Joffrey Baratheon. Give me the similarity scores for all of Joffrey Baratheon. Um, and, and that's all cool. It's like, you know, whatever you need to do. Okay. At the very beginning of the talk, I said weighted graphs. I showed the maps, the Google map problem of getting to the airport. And I was like, yeah, weighted graphs are cool. Didn't I say that? Maybe I didn't say those words, but weighted graphs are cool. And you know, this is, this is kind of going with the philosophy of the more data is more. If I know the strength of those relationships, my models get a lot better. So um, 
it turns out that our graph within that database that we spun up is a weighted graph. Okay, and we can do things with those weighted graphs that are that are going to be a lot of fun. So for instance, we're going to create an in memory graph now. And this is a much more sophisticated way to create the graph. There's two ways to create in memory graphs, you can, um, you can create one with what's called a cipher projection, one which called a native projection. This is the native projection here. Um, you'll want to read the API docs if you're interested in that the native projections are, are much faster. Um, and so let me kind of walk you through with what I'm doing here. So I've I've got this graph name here, GOT weighted interactions. I'm going to take all of my person nodes, but now I'm going to get a little bit more specific about my interaction nodes. Okay. Um, I have an orientation. I'm going to treat this as an undirected graph. Okay. Now the graph itself is directed, but sometimes algorithms prefer to run on undirected graphs. You can have natural direction, which basically means whatever way the arrow goes, go with it. Um, but then I have some properties here, and one of them is weight. Okay, and in the node or in, in the edge, the relationship, it is actually called weight. So I tell it that. Um, and if I don't have one, I'm going to set a default value of zero. And I'm going to run this query to generate my in memory graph. Okay, so I've got now my in memory graph, and I am going to use it to do community detection. Okay, so if we think back here, let's come back to our window here. Um, I am going to back up here and I'm going to go match um, N and just some random node. I'm going to say this is just going to be my interacts graph with M. I'm going to return N and M and I'm going to say limit. Let's make this a little bit bigger. Okay, let's look at this as a pretty picture. It's going to take it a second. Okay, so it's bobbling around and making all of the dots where it wants them. You already see that there is this concept here. Um, you can kind of see some sort of clusters forming maybe. Um, community detection is all about finding those smaller clusters within a bigger graph. And like I said earlier, there's a whole bunch of ways to do it, but kind of one of the more standard here is with Louvain. Um, and Louvain modularity. Now, you can see that my arrows here are pretty long, which would suggest that my strength of connection, my weight is small between, um, you know, here's, uh, let's see, you can kind of see how the edges are highlighting themselves. So we're going to take advantage of the fact that we have a weighted graph here. If you can have a weighted graph, always have a weighted graph if it's possible to do it. So using those weights, we can establish um, our communities much in a much more accurate way. So let's do it. Okay, so Louvain, like I said, common uh, community detection method, and it exists within GDS. We're gonna just stream this back to the screen. Okay, so here is how I would do that. I have my, I'm telling Louvain to give me, with this name in memory graph, the, the weighted one that we just created, we have our relationship weight property is called weight. Okay, and I'm going to return this back to the screen. And this is just an order of community ID number. Now, community IDs are random integers. So like every time I run this, um, because we're talking about a stochastic process, we are going to get different community ID numbers every time. Um, so, you know, don't don't get so hung up on what the exact number is. Just look at more who's in that cluster. Um, and so like I'm going to see this community ID of 13 and I've got Asha Greyjoy, and I've got Balon Greyjoy, okay? As you might infer, they might be related. And in fact, Balon is Asha's father. Um, Asha is actually the name of um, Theon's sister, although they change it for the TV shows. Don't ask me why, but but yeah, so th those make sense. But let's, uh, let's look at a few more things about that. I'm gonna actually write those communities now Instead of using dot stream, I've got dot write here. Okay, so I'm going to write my communities back to uh, as properties back to my nodes. Okay, I have a community count of 1,382. Modularity. My modularity tells me how distinct are my communities. Higher numbers are better here. Okay. Okay. So yeah, we showed how you can do that, but do these things make any sense? Let's look at some of the, the major characters. 
Okay, so when I'm gonna do this, I'm, this is one of the great reasons why uh, we wrote PageRank back to the nodes to begin with, because I'll sort this by PageRank. So what I'm gonna do, here's my Cypher query, I'm gonna get all of the people, and let's just, let's just do this for Starks, okay? So this is, this is kind of a little sort of regex here. Um, you can do proper regex within Cypher, but I just wanna say um, the person's name. So this is how I specify a property, my variable P, dot name means the property name of the variable p contains stark okay i'm going to return my name my the community that they belong to and page rank and like i said i'm going to order this by page rank a descending page rank okay so i've got sansa stark here um, and she's got the highest page rank of all of the starks probably because she's in all five of the books and she interfaces with uh, a lot of very important players. Um, for those of you who uh, remember Tyrion Lannister had the highest page rank. Sansa and Tyrion wind up having a relationship. I won't go into details about what that is, just don't want to spoil it. Um, so she's identified as being in community number 203. But a lot of her siblings, Rob, Rickon, Eddard, Eddard and Catelyn are her parents, and they're put in this community 530. Okay, so why Sansa is not in the same community as the rest of them is because Sansa winds up going and living in a different place. Okay, so she's interacting with a lot of non-Starks, which is why she's probably in a different community. Um, Arya Stark, same thing. Arya is Sansa's sister. She winds up going and gallivanting about the countryside, and so she winds up in a, in a different community as herself, but or as the other Starks. But you can see these, these things kind of make sense. So, you know, I can get behind that. Okay, machine learning, great. I've got, you know, I've got communities and node similarity, but I wanna do some of my own ML. I've got my own pipelines I wanna run in this. How am I gonna do that? Well, obviously we need to turn everything into a graph or into a vector. Everything already is a graph. We have to turn it into a vector, um, some sort of embedding. And within GDS, we have three different ways that you can generate embeddings. And again, all we're doing is returning a graph into a series of numbers. If you're interested in the math behind that, um, these, are, these are all kind of um, random projections. They, you're gonna do random hopping around the graph for a lot of these things. Very similar <coughs> to how word to vec works in natural language processing. So if you wanna know the math, what we're doing is we're basically translating word to vec into um, node to vec is one of the more common parallels to that. But I'm going to use this thing called fast RP, fast random projection. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create, this is just a simple four-dimensional embedding. Um, you'd never want to create something with that few dimensions, but this is just for demonstration purposes. Um, so I'm going to create a four-dimensional embedding, and I'm going to write it back to my nodes as this thing called FRP emb, so fast RP embeddings, um, on my weighted graph. Okay, so when I do that, um, I can, I'm just going to look at a few of these embeddings, and here's Tyrion Lannister, and you can see his embeddings right here. Okay, so cool, we created some vectors. Neat. Okay, all of data science, all of machine learning is about creating vectors. Let's do something with them now. Okay, so um, I am going to return the cosine similarity of two people, namely Tywin Lannister, that's Tyrion's father, for those of you who don't know, and Jaime Lannister, Tyrion's brother. Okay, so basically all that is happening here is you're running cosine similarity right within the database. Um, and I see I have a very nice, a very high similarity. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with cosine similarity, perfect similarity, perfect match would be 1.0. Complete mismatch would be negative 1.0. That's the two vectors are pointing absolutely in the opposite directions. Zero similarity whatsoever would be 0 0.0. Okay, so let's let's see if we can take two characters who really should not be related at all and see what their similar, similarity looks like. So I did this for Harma. I think Harma is one of the Hills tribes people. Don't, you know, somebody that Tywin Lannister is not going to encounter that much. And you can see here that their similarity is very small. Okay. Now, I've shown you creation of vectors, <clears throat> and anything that you can do with a vector in traditional machine learning, you can do with, with these graph embedding vectors. I'm not going to spoil the surprise. I want you to get in there and tinker with these things and learn these things. You can throw those vectors into scikit-learn, TensorFlow, whatever you want. Um, the bottom line, though, is that, that 
vector embeddings enable you to do all of your normal machine learning. <clears throat> you just happen to be doing it on a graph. Okay, so that's, that's what I want you to take away from this. So we're going to come back to our slides here. Okay. All right, we've done that part. Okay. Here is probably the most important slide for this entire talk. First off, there, this is the, the very first thing here is the, the repo. So that data science graph intro repo thing, that'll take you to my GitHub. It has the, uh, the Jupyter notebooks and whatnot in there. Um, if you want to run this in Docker, I mentioned before, you can run Neo4j in any number of different ways. Um, there's a link to just my little Docker setup. I use this thing all the time for uh, running both Neo4j on my local machine as opposed to in the cloud, as well as JupyterLab linked to it. Um, I showed you today how you could create a free database um, with the sandbox, and that's the link right there. There's another thing that Neo4j released called Aura, which is a cloud-hosted solution, um, and you bring your own data, here's, here's your database, it's, there's a link to it right there. This just came out. The one thing I will tell you is that it does not include the Graph Data Science Library. So I would recommend if you want to play around with GDS that you do it in Sandbox instead. Um, there, there's a link right there to the GDS library. So those are the API docs on how to run it. But like I said, using that browser guide um, that was at the very start of the Sandbox, that's going to walk you through how to do all of this stuff. And then some, it's going to take you into all kinds of different things like triangle counting and identifying weakly connected components. That's like, you know, the one node that, you know, is kind of hanging out there by itself. And, you know, we don't even always care about those things. Um, there's just so many things that you can do with graphs, so many calculations built into it. And you can see how to do all of those with the GDS library here. And then um, there's also this great book, and I'm looking over my shoulder, hoping that I have it within reach because of course I don't, but the Graph Algorithms book. This was written by Mark Needham and Amy Hodler, and it is kind of the definitive work on what graph analytics and graph data science are and mean and what you can do. Um, if you click on that link, it's available for free download. You can get your own printed version if you want uh, from O'Reilly. And it's it really is just kind of a great thing that walks you through what's happening behind the scenes with all of these different algorithms. How how does Louvain actually work? Um, label propagation. Um, there's there's just so many different algorithms that you can run on a graph that I, I can't even scratch the surface on in this talk today. Um, so hopefully all of these links can get you get you started, get you pointed in the right direction. Um, and with that, I just want to say thank you again. I've come to the end of my presentation, but I hope it's just the start of you guys getting excited and involved with graphs, looking at the power that they can provide to your existing models and your future models. Just always keep in the back of your head, how might my independent measurements be actually related to each other? And that, that will just open up a whole new world of thinking for your future model development and improve your accuracy. Um, if you would like to reach out to me, I am available on Twitter. Here's my Twitter handle, CJLovesData1. Um, feel free to hit me up there. And I guess that's it. So good luck in your data science journey. And always, always, always be thinking about graphs as part of that. Thanks a lot.